we've talked about transport, deposition, and erosion. Let's talk about the stream flow, the actual movement of the river, because this is extremely important. You're going to see different types of flow in streams, and that's going to cause different sorts of landforms forming on each side of the bank or around the general area. So it's very important to understand that the velocity and the energy of a river are controlled by several factors. Now, these, uh, starting off this factor is the gradient of the channel bed, how the slope, basically how, how steep it is, the volume of the water within the channel, which is usually controlled by precipitation, so the amount of water in the channel, the shape of the channel. Remember, not all channel shapes are kind of like bowls. Some of them are like rectangular, some of them might be square, some of them might be a little bit more uh, like diagonal. It depends on the shape of the channel. And channel roughness, which includes friction. So the channel roughness uh, depends on how many, uh, how large particles, like your big boulders versus just sand or clay that might be in here. So the velocity of the energy of the river are controlled by those factors. Now there's three main types of stream flow, and we're going to talk about each of them in turn. So we have laminar flow, we have turbulent flow, and helicoidal flow. Now each of them does something a little bit different for the land. So let's take a look. First, laminar flow. Now laminar flow is all the flow in a stream goes in one direction with little to no mixing. So all the stream, basically the, all the water rushes directly in one way and that's it. Now unfortunately this is not very common on surface waters because we have a lot going on. So we, what we really need is a smooth, straight channel where there's a low velocity. Now this is a must if we are to see laminar flow. Typically we see this a lot in groundwater or glaciers. So as glaciers melt, we see this going in one direction. In groundwater, if we were to take a look, if we had access to look at groundwater, we would see that this also flows in one direction. Now the flow will run parallel to the channel bed. So all the water is moving in one direction. Not, none of that water starts to go from side to side. It's directly forward, directly in a straight line. So in this picture, notice the laminar flow, you can kind of see all of it just going in one direction. And that's usually with the current. Our second type of stream flow is called turbulent flow. Now this is the flow where the particles can move in any direction and at any time. However, the overall movement is kind of with the, with the current. So it does flow in one direction. However, like you can see in the picture, it sort of moves in general directions. So you see a lot of the water maybe kind of turning. It's going to flip around and go under, create little um, kind of like little circles. It, it's a very turbulent flow. Now, we could, don't necessarily have to have a lot, like a large turbulence in order for this to happen. It happens on normal streams most of the time. Because if you think about it, there might be big rocks in the way, there might be something in the way that requires it to the, the water to sort of move around it. So complex morphology with high velocity is required. So we, have, do we, we do have to have a pretty high stream flow in order for this to happen but you can sort of see this in some other places as well, like small streams that maybe don't necessarily have a, a very high velocity. The turbulence of the water is associated with hydraulic action. And remember in the last video, we talked about that hydraulic action and how it causes um, basically air and, and water sort of get into those little cracks and they force those little cracks open and that's what causes the erosion in those particular places. So we see a lot of hydraulic action in these types of flows. Now we also see vertical abrasion and cavitation, which may deepen the channel. So vertical abrasion, if you remember abrasion is basically where you have those rocks and stuff eroding along the bottom, the, the channel bed and the banks of the river as well. So if it goes vertically, it means it's going up and down. In this case, it's gonna go down and it's gonna deepen those channels. Cavitation also happens that way. You see those little bubbles, those pockets of like implosion basically, and that's going to break those rocks apart. And it's going to deepen that channel. 
Now, this could ca cause lateral er erosion as well, and this causes a gully or a gorge to develop. So if, it, um, if the banks are basically eroded away from side to side, and that's the lateral erosion, we're going to get a widening of the river, and we might get a gully or possibly a gorge. So the Grand Canyon was actually formed in this manner by turbulent flow. So the Grand Canyon is an excellent um, example of turbulent fro flow, especially by this vertical abrasion and the cavitation. And sometimes also some of that lateral erosion has eroded away parts of the uh, Grand Canyon. It's widened it in cer certain areas too. So turbulent flow, think of the Grand Canyon when um, thinking of an example. We also see helicoidal flow. Now helicoidal flow is a little bit different because we see things, um, those water molecules are actually moving in corkscrew motions. Oops, sorry about that. So in corkscrew motions, kind of think of that movement kind of like a corkscrew, up and down, up and down. You're going to have all these particles move that way. Now in places like this, we actually see large amounts of se sediments carried in flows like this. And this creates meanders. And soon we're going to be talking about meanders. But if you think of, uh, um, if you think of somebody meandering back and forth, back and forth, helicoidal flow works the same way. We have this corkscrew motion of, that, of the water molecules, and it's creating the water to kind of go back and forth. And eventually it creates those large meanders and those large meandering rivers that um, are so prevalent in some areas. So in this picture, we see more of a, a 3D model of it, or what should have been a 3D model, whereas the right-hand side, this figure one, um, we can kind of see the corkscrew motion kind of doing this, with the main current kind of still going down the middle. But that corkscrew motion really messes with a lot of that side-to-side -side movement of the actual channel. Now we see different channel types, and this is all really because of these types of flows. So you can actually go back and sort of match up from one place to another. A couple words to sort of know to throw more vocabulary at you. Sinuosity. Now this is the length of a stream channel that's expressed as a ratio of the valley length. So it basically is talking about the valley length and we're putting a ratio to it on how long the, str the, the stream channel actually is. So we're said to have, or a river is said to have, a low sinuosity, typically if it's a straight channel. And we're going to talk about what a straight channel is. So anything that has a value of about 1 or close to 1 in that very general area has a low sinuosity. Anything that has a high sinuosity is said to be above 4.4, and this is going to be meandering. So if you take the length of the channel, it might be longer than the valley length that it runs through. So this is why meandering rivers, as the picture down here kind of shows, these are going to be technically longer because there's more river, there's more channel. Whereas if it was a straight channel, that'd be pretty low. The ratio would be pretty close to 1 to 1. Now we also see this term thalweg. And this is the line of maximum velocity or basically the line of fastest flow. So in some cases, and, and so far we're really not going to talk too much about Thalweg, but in some cases along the river, there are some geologists that actually go through and they test a certain length of river to see where that line of fastest flow is, because the flow changes along the river. So it's very important to know where exactly that line is along the river, and people do that. And that's called the Thalweg how fast a certain point is going along the river, the fastest point there. Now, there's three types of channels, and I sort of mentioned two of them up top. We have a straight channel. Now, this channel is generally uh, has a central ridge of deposited material. So on the sides, we have some deposited material, and that's because w our, um, our water is just basically going straight. And this is what you would see in laminar flow basically where the water is going directly straight. These are really hard to find because um, they're, it, by over time, it's going to start to meander. It's going to start doing that side-to-side -side motion. So straight channels are really hard to find. We see these a lot in young places, like very young rivers, or perhaps in areas like 
glacial areas where we have just a nice steep gradient and um, we have a nice straight channel from there. A second type of channel is called a meandering channel and this is where you get those long curves back and forth and in the picture you can sort of see this nice meandering channel right here. So whoop whoop all that nice meandering channel. And that's going to form because of that helicoidal flow that we just talked about. We also see uh, the third type which is called a braided channel. Now this is probably f uh, a little bit more more seen in some places, partly a, a lot so much in Florida as well because of our um, our level of water that we see in some channels. But these are channels that develop when sediment exceeds transport capacity. So there's too much sediment in the actual water. The water can't hold it all. So this results in dep deposition of several sandbars and gravel bars. And so you can kind of see in here you actually see all these places of sediment that were dropped out of the load. There's not enough water to carry all that sediment, so it's basically just deposited right there. Now, islands are long-lived and they may have vegetation, whereas bars are short-lived and they do not have vegetation. So if you see a river kind of like this and there might be some vegetation growing in the middle of one of these islands, you know that that's been there a pretty long time. Now these are formed by various factors as well. Perhaps we have a really steep channel gradient. Perhaps there's a large proportion of coarse material, really large rocks going on. Perhaps there's an easily erodible bank material along the side. Like in this case, that kind of that's sort of what it looks like. This area is just really nicely eroded, so we can kind of pick it up, the water kind of picks it up as it goes but it's not fast enough. There's not enough capacity in that river to carry it all. Or we might see high, um, highly variable discharge. So maybe the river in this picture um, at certain times of year is moving really fast with a high amount of water in it. Unfortunately, maybe some times of the year there's not enough water there to um, hold all of that stuff. So the discharge there is a little bit less 